With me still in the studio, I have uh, Professor Bola Quintero, our Director General of Bulitech Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Dr. Ndidi Nwaneri, Public Policy Consultant and Visiting Scholar, Loyola University, Chicago, United States. And Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Well, Prof, let me start with you. Today we had uh, two guests, uh, Professor Usman Yusuf and Senator Biodun Ulujimi. And between the two of them, you know, they raised a number of critical issues about how Nigeria has fared in the last uh, 22 years and how Nigeria has also fared under uh, six years of uh, uh, President Mohamed Buhari's uh, administration and many national issues that affect us, from security uh, to state politics to relationships and big issues at the heart of the national question. Prof, what are the big takeaways for you? Let me start uh, on a lighter mood that um, I admire the position of um, Senator Biodun Olujimi by telling us that... Um, Prof, it, it you are romantic. Sense. You have to start with a woman. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that uh, the principles of fairness, justice, equity require that we think that if not central, you know, um, districts had had five, you know, year uh, having five um, local governments, the south from where she comes Ekiti State, in Ekiti State, uh, has six local governments. And they have not been given the opportunity to produce, you know, a candidate for possible election. I think it's quite right. So in this case, there is the need to always um, try to err on the side of fairness, justice. What I admire again there is that uh, she is telling us indirectly that nothing prevents her from being uh, a potential candidate, even though she's using the arguments of uh, fairness and justice to be there. But let's come to Professor Osman Yusuf. And for reasons of uh, professorial psychology of human differences, he's entitled to the opinions he has expressed. But why I disagree with him on in this in this particular case, you have um, the professor on the one hand, when you did ask him about his opinion on Femi Adesina's hypothesis that Nigerians should wait and see that the future will be golden. Now he responded by saying that, well, he was no longer interested in all these jamborees that uh, he has shot his eyes, he doesn't want to see, he doesn't want to hear things like that. Yet, what you refuse to see, you are pontificating. You are making uh, recommendations, opinions on that. I find that one scientifically conflicting. It should not be done at uh, the professorial level. Professorial submissions must always be predicated, driven, by objectivity of purpose, by honesty of purpose. A professor, that title itself, you know, the title of professorship is not honorary. It's not a chieftaincy title. It must be earned. And when you talk, it is just like as if you are professing. So if he now comes with um, partisan positions, to, to make a partisan hypothesis and submitted as a probably reflecting the facts. No, I would disagree. In this case, what has he said? He first of all said that uh, the Igbo people, they are killing um, Fulanese. I think that one 
is not tenable, uh, a good hypothesis for research. We wouldn't have time to go much into details. Well, Prof, so before you go far, Professor then, Usman Yusuf was not here for a viva voice. He was expressing an opinion I as a not, citizen I am, from his own perspective. I am so also, it has nothing to do with research. I am also he was speaking expressing as a citizen. A, an opinion no, based but, on... No, I don't question his uh, credentials. I'm not questioning his credentials. I'm questioning the, the basis of the submission of his opinion. Because everybody is listening. Okay, for instance, now let me tell you. When he's referring to the South East, South, South, Southwest, that uh, what they all say is, um, is nothing better than rubbish all along. You must be able to substantiate. He might be correct. But you don't say it without justifying. For instance, the arguments, the issues at stake now is that, first of all, when he's saying absolutely restructuring cannot hold without going through the National Assembly, I will agree. But another school of thought says that the National Assembly itself is fraudulent. The election that took place that enabled the membership of the uh, National Assembly itself is fraudulent. That the 1999 constitution that we are referring to is also fraudulent. It, everybody has agreed that, look, Decree 24 enabled that. They say it's military constitution. And people are arguing now that, look, you cannot be talking about an amendment, a review, um, a modification of the constitution but that we need a fresh constitution afresh. Why? <clears throat> they have given two uh, good reasons. Reason one is that if we are to vote on the basis of a regional north versus regional south, under no circumstance will there be any change. The north, because they have the majority in terms of number of votes in the National Assembly, there's no recommendation that can come to the National Assembly that will not be killed. Okay, at this Anna, point, Prof, let me okay. take uh, Dr. Nwaneri's uh, contribution. Yesterday was May 29, 22 years after the return to uh, civilian rule, six years after the uh, uh, Buhari administration. Where are we? What are your thoughts? Within the context of the conversations we have had with our two guests, um, so, um, where does one start? The Nigeria challenge is very complex, but within the context of what Professor Usman Yusuf said, I'm glad you clarified that he is not, he did not come here as an academic. He came as a citizen. A well-informed one, but a citizen all the same. So I'm going to pick up on some, on some things that I agree with. Um, in a society, so, so there's this consensus that half of Nigeria would at least agree that we have to do something. The other half are, um, let us split the country. But until we do that, right, I agree with him that by the time an ethnic group, a specific ethnic group, feels so unsafe that a mass exodus happens from one region to another, it, it sends a very, very bad message. The reverse has not happened with the other ethnic groups. So I agree with him on that. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about the message it sends to ordinary people on the streets. Then um, another area I agree is that the government has failed. So to the extent that an administration comes in and says that we are going to do X, Y, Z in 10 years. I find that a bit problematic because last I checked, the longest a president can be in power is eight years. So that statement in itself makes me question the, the, the government in itself in the sense that what do you mean you're going to do something in 10 years? You're only going to be in power. This administration will be in power for maximum eight years. So that utterance in itself, um, I would not use the term, I wouldn't use a derogatory term, but I find it a bit problematic. So I agree with him in that 
um, dimension. But I have a problem with how he lumps all governors in the last 22 years into one sentence, as if they occupy, as if they're identical, as if they're coming from one place. And that is one of the challenges I have with when we're discussing Nigeria. Which governor did what? Which citizens enabled a governor to do what? Who looted the public treasury, went back home, and their people did not recognize that it is their own money that this particular governor is spending? I'm not going to sweat that. Let me just leave that alone. He said something about infrastructure, um, how he feels that people should, the, the political class should invest in persons and not buildings and structures. To that extent, I agree with him. And I'm going to explain why this happens, which is not justifying it. My, my challenge with the Nigerian public is that we tend to forget that politicians, this is their job. Their job is to get reelected. Every other thing is fine print. So when the citizens give the politicians full responsibility. I've said this and I've said this, and I will say it again. Democracy is not a date. Democracy is not an action. It's not, one, it's not voting someone in. Democracy is holding the person responsible for being voted in. So our culture of not even knowing the names of our senators, that is part of what has brought us here. So that thing of lumping everybody together into an undifferentiated mass is a very Nigerian way of looking at the political Class, right? It, it, they're, not, they're, not, they're not identical. They're not coming from the same village. They're a bunch of in, they're individuals that have come from different places. It's very telling. One thing I agree with him, and one thing I'd like to point out is that most governors have behaved badly. So in 22 years, we have a political class that has raped and plundered the country. So I guess the good thing about lumping everybody together is you know, nobody will say that I'm picking on any state. So there's an extent to which I agree with him, but this thing of identifying the political class as if we didn't produce them, as if we are not responsible. So what I'd like to ask everybody in this room is, who, who knows the name of their senator? Who? Well, I, so I, I'll stop there. I, well, I thought you were going to comment on the point made by uh, Senator Biodun Olujimi about gender empowerment, gender equality, and how that showed up in the conversation uh, at the uh, public hearings held uh, across the country. But we need to take a short break okay. at this point, Dr. Nwaneri. So we take a short break. When we return, we'll go straight to Yemi Adamolekun for our contribution. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Stay with us. Welcome back to This Alive, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. With me, I still have Professor Bola Akintenwa, Director General of Bolitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Dr. Ndidi Nwaneri, Public Policy Consultant and Visiting Scholar, Loyola University, Chicago, in the United States. And Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office in Off. Well, Yemi, let me come to you uh, very quickly. Uh, we have our two guests, Professor Usman Yusuf and Senator Biodun Olujime. And of course, the main issue is Nigeria, 22 years after return to civilian rule and six years of the uh, Buhari uh, administration. Your thoughts on what has been going on in Nigeria and whether democracy has served us well, and if it has not, what are the big issues that we need to worry about? Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll start by actually agreeing with Professor Kintenwa, and I'm sure the reason would not be too far-fetched. And I do agree with him that, yes, Professor Husman was there as a citizen, but he's also a professor. And it's a title that he carries. It's a title that he was introduced with. And so with the title comes a certain expectation of how he processes information. So that's really the thing. So, yes, it's his opinion, but there's an expectation that he will process the information a certain way. It's like inviting a medical doctor to a panel and you don't expect him to bring his medical knowledge if he's talking about COVID or if he's talking about anything in that field. It influences how you see issues and how you present issues. And that's why I definitely agree with Professor Kintanewa on that. And I also agree with him. Um, I didn't read Premier Adishino's 
press release because I'm, I'm tired of kind of reading his garbage, to put it mildly. But I think ultimately it's not really about infrastructure or aviation or what was done in power. And I like Professor Husman's nailing it down on investment in people. What's the point in investing in rail where people are so poor that they go and, and destroy it? What's the point in building a road where people are not safe on it so people stop using it? So Abuja, Kaduna Rail Lines has been shut down several times for security reasons. People, um, Dr. Maneri mentioned, oh no, it was Dr. Uh, Mrs. Olujimi that talked about the, that the students were dropped on the road and nobody saw anything, nobody said anything. So I think for me, it's not in those things. It's Let us look at what has President Buhari's administration done for Nigerians. And if we actually assess him based on what he himself set out to do, corruption, the economy, and security, he's failed on those things, on those met 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 metrics. And so I think it's it's not really, I don't think, I, I, I wouldn't spend much time looking at those things. Because ultimately, at the heart of it, you are in office to lead a people. So six years into your leadership, people feel less Nigerian, people feel less safe, people feel um, that they don't matter, people feel that you don't care. So forget the roads and forget everything else. Mm. And I also like Dr. Waneri's point. You want to take people out of poverty in 10 years, you have two years left in your, mm -hmm. in your administration, and you are, saying, you are expecting, <laughs> you are telling us to watch the wonders that are going to happen, happen when in six years you haven't done anything, or you haven't done anything to set the foundation for those wonders to happen. And I'll go back to investment in, in people and how critical that is. That goes to Dr. Uh, Mrs. Olujimi's point as well about equity. So it's not nearly about equality, because Dr. Abati, the way you are saying that equality, you are saying it's almost smirking, not fully that you understand and you support it. I'm not putting you on the spot, but I'm just saying. <laughs> but I think we should, think about, we should think about it in terms of equity, and it's just equity in terms of opportunities. We're very different. Men are different from women. Nobody is saying men and women are exactly the same. We're very different. We were created differently. But we should both sexes should have equal access to opportunities, and that at the heart of it is what what the advocacy for gender equality is all about. And for me, and I'll say that, I'll take that a step further, the, ad, the advocacy for 111 seats, I don't support it. But I understand how women have got into, because men are telling you clearly we're not giving up our seats. And because if you look at it now, we're going to add another seat for a woman in the Senate. She's going to be called a senator like every other woman in the Senate, but she's going to be representing a whole state. She's going to campaign literally like she's campaigning to be governor. So she's going to get the same salary. She's going to be compared on the same basis. How that is equity, I really don't know. But hey, that's a conversation for another day. Nelson Mandela also has a, converse, has a quote. I'll find it before the end of the show about how you can assess a country by the importance they place on their children. Mm -hmm. Over a thousand students have been kidnapped in Nigeria, I believe since 2014. And um, Professor Usman spoke quite a bit about the negotiations with bandits sitting down. I still don't understand that sitting down with criminals, but at least they didn't pay them any ransom. Greenfield University, we still have three students who haven't returned. 118 million naira by parents. And again, the parallel with the National Assembly who wants to prosecute people who pay a ransom, showing where we are. And I'll land on two points that I think is also quite critical. The issue of mass exodus. As a country, again, we don't do well with data. So this whole mass exodus is anecdotal, as far as I'm concerned, because nobody has given me numbers, names, and dates. This date, 20 Fulani people migrated. This date, 50 Igbo people migrated. Because so as a country that's interested in making its citizens feel like the country belongs to them, we need to pay more attention to data. But our dishonesty in doing that goes back to if you look at our census. A study has been shown that every census that's, that we've con conducted in Nigeria, the percentage increase in every state has been exactly the same. So if Kano started with 2 million people, you increase Kano by uh, 5% in the, whatever, the 66 census, the 68 census, every census, they, there's an exact percentage increase in every state. How is that possible? It's like, mathematically, that makes no sense. So it means we are not counting anything. I just adding a percentage to it and extrapolating and saying this is it. And we have not had a census, I think, in over a decade, if not in two decades. So how does a country plan without data? How do you know, how do you plan for your citizens? But again, we've politicized data because we understand that it matters and we don't want it to matter, so we've refused to do it. And then lastly, this issue of security. I read the um, 
press statement by the Commissioner of Police in Imo about um, Mr. Gulak's death. My condolences, Dr. Abati, on Dr. Gulak's death. And he said that Dr. Gulak left for the airport without informing the police. So if that is not an admission of the fact that we've completely lost control of security, I don't know what is. So everybody should now be informing the police, oh, by the way, I'm going to airport. By the way, I need to take a one-hour road trip. Or is it only for VIPs that are meant to inform the police? Or is it because he's a northerner who is in a southern state, therefore he must inform the police so they can guarantee his safety? And if I'm not mistaken, the cab driver, nobody has said anything about him dying. So, I mean, we look at all these things. Okay, let me not say lastly. I have, I still have one more point or two. Professor Husman as well talks about governors, and I agree with him. Yes, it's a broad, broad uh, stroke against all governors. But if you take Delta for example, under Delta State, Ibori carried loot. We've returned the money from London, but we've returned it to Delta State. How that makes any sense, I don't get it. But we've done it. But I do agree that governors have a lot more power, and that we should, as citizens, also hold them a bit more account, not a bit, hold them a lot more accountable and put a more fire under them. But it's just the way that this whole notion that everything is at the center. So focusing on a president that's not present, in a sense, for a lot of Nigerians, just sets the tone for the rest of what's happening in the country. So it's easier to focus on President Buhari's absence because it just shows that this is why everybody's missing at their job. The fish rots from the head. Hmm? So if we have a president that's present, that doesn't seem to care. It, 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 it does sort of set a foundation for where we are. And lastly, on this issue of the constitution, yes, as it's currently constituted, there's nothing in the constitution that provides for it to be scrapped, obviously, for obvious reasons. So all this tinkering that we're doing is technically the only thing the National Assembly can do. But I believe as citizens, if we realize that our president is not present, and we realize that our governors are not are politicking or are more focused about next election. Oh, sorry, I wanted to say that as well. Sorry. One, one more point. Um, Mrs. Oluchi Meade spoke a lot about the government, they, when they. Mm. Is she not in government? Or did I miss the memo? I know she's talking about the executive, and I know that, and I know they try to separate themselves, but as a citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, all of you together, plus governors, plus legislature, plus executive, plus you judiciary, you well, form yeah, the federal government. Of, of of Nigeria. So she can't excuse us. I'm sorry, Dr. Abati, last point. She yeah. can't excuse herself and say the government, they, them. PDP is Nigeria's supposedly opposition party. And as a party, yeah, yeah, they have not stepped up as opposition to challenge the governing party. Well, yeah, me, we'll, Thank you. On this point, we'll need to take a short commercial break. The conversation has been uh, all over the place, I guess, because there were so many issues raised. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Professor Bola Akintenawa, Director General of the Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies, Dr. Ndidi Mwaneri, Public Policy Consultant and Visiting Scholar, Loyola University, Chicago, and Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director Enough is enough. Now, let's go to our next subject. There have been calls from Nigerians for the government to give up its exclusive powers over the police, railways, mining, and minimum wage. Others are seeking an entirely new constitution rather than amendments. These were among many suggestions to come out of the zonal public hearings on the constitution review held across the country this week. Our political editor, Sumna Sambo, reports. The zonal public hearing of the constitutional review by the Senate got underway across the country in 12 centers with six geopolitical zones. Nigerians in various groups made presentations with so many voicing out concerns on the reforms that they want. While some groups want specific amendments, others want the entire 1999 constitution discarded for a new document. But most Nigerians were unanimous in asking the federal government to devolve its powers to allow for state police and give states more powers over railways, mining and others. They also want a new revenue formula, fiscal federalism and other demands. I proposed a, a radical change whereby the federal government will get 34%, state governments will get 42%, 
and the local government will get 23%. Any contemplation to remove the national minimum wage from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list will only expose Nigeria to international ridicule and oppression. We like to submit that subsection B should be altered and amended to reflect such number of justices of the Supreme Court, not less than 37, but not exceeding 49 as may be prescribed by an act of the National Assembly. I also believe that there may be the need for us to look very closely on ways and means of rewriting the Constitution as a new document, even while the current Constitution does exist. I am of the strong conviction that we need to devote powers in our country to the balance of federation for better governance. But I do not share the view that restructuring or devolution is a silver bullet that will solve all our problems overnight. I believe the need for this special status has been sufficiently articulated and justified. It suffices for me at this point to restate that this request is by no means a selfish one, but one that is actually in the interest of every Nigerian and of Nigeria as a nation. The demands also include state creation, a special economic status for Lagos as Nigeria's economic capital, democratization of governance in the federal capital territory Abuja to allow for an elected mayor, and the adoption of the 1963 constitution to allow for regionalism. The National Assembly delegation to the hearings promised Nigerians that in the areas where there is consensus, the people's will will prevail, and that in other difficult areas, negotiations and voting by lawmakers will resolve the issues. This ongoing review pro provides a platform for the good people of Nigeria to express their opinions on the fundamental laws that govern our lives through proposals that will lead to the highest good for the greatest number of people. Let me also remind our fellow patriots, countrymen and women, that the Constitution Review represents a critical phase in our development and advancement as a nation. When the people are fully involved, they will own the process, legitimize it, and defend its outcome. There is no better time to pass laws regarding state police, state judiciary, resource control, and revenue allocation in favor of the states. Describing the 1999 document as a unitary constitution, many Nigerians want the amendment to reflect true federalism in the document, including reforms in other areas such as residency, local government, gender equality, legislative and judicial autonomy. Sumner Sambu, Arise News. Well, that report there by uh, Sumner Sambu about the process that we have had uh, this week and the key issues emerging from the conversations. In the northern part of the country, the Northern Governors Forum are saying any constitutional amendment should be within the context of uh, unity, stability, and the indissolubility, indivisibility of uh, Nigeria. In the southern part of the country, uh, the uh, you know, uh, outcomes have been uh, about fiscal federalism, devolution of powers, state police, and the need for justice, equity, and fairness. But let me start with uh, Yemi Adamoleko. Yemi, uh, what do you make of the public hearings about the uh, current process to amend the Constitution, the 1999 Constitution? Thank you. And sorry, you were right. I was all over the place earlier. There were just a lot of issues to get. <laughs> no, it's okay. Get. It's fine. I mean, 22 <laughs> years of democracy. So, <laughs> you know, it's possible to take on so many issues. But it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Now, on the Constitution, I think I agree. I mean, Olisa Agbakuba was on a program hosted by Fixed Politics about a week ago. And he made the clear point that, yes, and it was also an editorial in the paper this morning. He made the point that, yes, the document is not perfect. But if you had people with sense, in a sense, um, it, the implementation of it will be much different and will be better. So what I see that a lot of Nigerians fundamentally are reacting to is, again, what I said earlier, a sense that the way Nigeria is structured and governed doesn't make them feel welcome, doesn't make them feel that they have equal opportunities and equal rights. And the leadership of the country, judiciary, legislative, and executive have not really done anything to change that narrative. 
So a lot of people see this amending process as just a jamboree. We'll tinker it here, tinker it there. But we haven't gone to the heart of how are we together as different ethnic groups? How do we relate to each other? And what is our shared common vision for this country? Yes, there are things that are written in our pledge. There are things that are written in our constitution about our values and all of that. But they're not things that are taught. And that's one of the things of this democracy. 22 years, yes. But we haven't been very deliberate about teaching ourselves about what it means to be in a democracy, which is why, as Dr. Nwaneri said, a lot of people don't know who their senators are. A lot of people don't know who represents them and don't, by extension, don't know the powers that they have to hold them accountable. It's one of the things EIA has advocated over the last six years, the concept of the office of the citizen being higher than the office of the president or the office of the governor because you put them in power. So therefore, they are there to work for you. And language is also very important. Mrs. Olujimi talked about ruling. I mean, it's not a monarchy. It's a democracy. You are there to serve. And you are there because we were elected for my own interests, expecting you to serve my interests as the citizens that put you there. So I think that whole notion of what a democracy means, something we have not taught, and I believe also deliberately from a political um, class point of view, but it's something that our citizens and, social, and other social ethnic groups need to step up and do that teaching to bridge, to bridge that gap. And lastly, I would say that on the constitutional matter, because of all these one step forward, one step back, we've had a national conference that its recommendations were not implemented. Perhaps what we need to advocate as a people, as citizens, is that, you know what, let's pause. Maybe what we need is to amend the constitution to provide for a referendum. So we can actually, as a citizen, vote on this issue of we need a new constitution and we don't keep throwing it out there. So if the constitution has a provision for a referendum and that's then put in place, and then we start the conversation and be like, almost ground zero, let's have a conversation about how we are together as people and how we want to move to forward as Nigeria. Mm -hmm. That might be a place to start. Well, at the Enugu uh, Public Airlines, uh, you know, that's the same position held by Senator Ike Ekuremado. Uh, former Deputy Senator of the President. He was saying that this constitution, the 1999 constitution, does not make a provision for a referendum mm -hmm. because the framers of the uh, constitution did not envisage that anybody would want to abandon that constitution or plead for secession. And he called yeah. for maybe the whole exercise, he will have section nine of the constitution to make a provision for a referendum. But would that happen? Will anybody be able to build a consensus on anybody having a referendum about the future of Nigeria. Dr. Maneri, over to you. I'm going to start by the last thing you said. And while you were talking, I was listening to you, but I was thinking about how, you know, there's this uh, street scene in Yoruba land. So what is it? <laughs> What is it about That's a document? That's one of our musicians. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, okay, I heard it on the, I heard it in motion. So, my question is, there's nothing that is written that cannot be edited. No argument is completely closed. I am shocked, and I hope you are wrong, that whoever wrote this constitution actually imagined that nobody would want to desire anything contrary to what is written there. I, I, I like the idea of a referendum, but I, I, I don't like the idea of um, when you, there's a form of intellectual laziness that causes you to hit the streets when you already have documents in place that you can adjust, alter, and change. But another way I agree with, um, I agree with you in the sense that Maybe, maybe the challenge is that people have lost hope in systems. Maybe they've decided that in the Nigerian system, no, nobody's going to hear the voice of the little um, person. Therefore, we're going to be violent. We're going to complain. But if we can actually adjust this constitution, we should go ahead and do that. I'd like to talk about um, the challenge you threw at me, the gender issue. Um, the only place I heard and actually, what I heard about Akura was that um, a CSO groups in Akura were complaining that the gender issue was not adequately addressed, which is very contrary to what the senator said um, happened. 
So maybe, maybe I got my facts wrong. But there is, I don't see any seriousness of intent on the part of the public with regards to gender equality. And we don't even focus on what improving gender, um, gender division of labor, for want of a better term. We do not discuss what it will add. We keep speaking about it as if we're doing women a favor. So I'm hoping that when we start talk, um, um, when we start adjusting the constitution, I'm hoping that the gender issue is taken very seriously, considering all the international covenants that we have signed. What I'd like to talk about um, with regards to the um, constitution is that everybody is in agreement about true federalism. And I feel that that is the way to go. We should take it seriously. But we should not be so irresponsible that we leave this question of people ruling themselves, people being in charge of their space to the streets. I think they should hasten this process. And I will end there. OK, Dr. Maneri, on that note, we take another short break here. On this is a live this Sunday talk show. When we return, we'll go straight to Professor Akintanawa for his input. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to This is Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. I still have with me in the studio, Professor Bola Akintenova, Director General of Bully Tax Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Dr. Ndidi Mwaneri, Public Policy Consultant and Visiting Scholar at Loyola University, Chicago, and Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Well, before we went on that break, uh, Prof, I was waiting for you to make your contribution with regard to the public hearings on constitutional amendment that we had this week. Yes, I'm always um, disturbed by and with um, very good suggestions. The suggestion by Yemi, as a follow-up to that of uh, Kurimadu, is quite good. That is the ideal thing. But will there be political will? Because earlier on, I drew attention to the fact that if we are to vote on the basis of geopolitical north versus geopolitical south, numerically, there is no way any amendment, any suggestion, be it plebiscite or um, review of a particular clause in the Constitution, if the geopolitical north as a body is opposed to it. Now, the issue in the country is that insecurity in Nigeria today, people have refused to look at it from what it is all about. Insecurity is currently driven by the misunderstanding between the Fulani people and the non-Fulani people. It is not a dispute between North and South. It is also a dispute, a conflict between, you know, um, religion and constitutionalism. All right? You have, uh, for instance, some people who believe that the country must be Islamized. Then you have the other people talking about the Constitution. In this case, the three main suggestions that are on the table, they are either uh, the belief that, look, you have to have a new Constitution, or you return to the 1963 Constitution, or that there should be a fresh uh, national dialogue. And I think that as the way forward, we need a national dialogue. And in this case, without doing that, anything you propose and the North is opposed to it, because they have the numerical strength, please, democracy is at best meaningless in that case. Okay, we'll take our final topic for the day. President Joe Biden of the United States has ordered United States intelligence agencies to investigate the origins of the coronavirus, calling for a broad government report on whether the virus 
was accidentally leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China. The request came as the WHO faced criticism over a March report dismissing the possibility of a laboratory accident. The theory was largely drowned out last year by scientists' accounts of the virus's more likely path from an animal host to humans in a natural setting. China has repeatedly denied the lab was responsible, saying the United States and other countries were trying to distract from their own failures to contain the virus. Well, quickly, uh, Dr. Mwaneri, this is uh, part of the politics of the vaccine that we have. Uh, what do you think? But just uh, note also that the WHO, in the March report, after back and forth politics with uh, China, also said that the investigation that was carried out by the team of scientists was inconclusive mm. and that there were other areas to look at. So the China has uh, reacted mm -hmm. to this uh, to say that, uh, no, it is not true, that some scientists uh, took ill uh, before the announcement of the outbreak of the uh, virus. So in, in that they are correct. So we all know about the arm wrestling and, um, you know, the posturing and the global power dynamics. You know, to be honest, I, I don't, if China was a person, even under torture, I don't think they're going to admit, nobody's going to admit anything on necessarily connecting their country, right, to something as devastating as um, COVID. Yes, it was um, first noticed in, in, a chi in Wuhan, in late 2019, and um, in February 2020, made it one year that Li Wenlang, of the, the Wuhan whistleblower, yeah. who tried to tell people that things are bad, and apparently the police shut him down. Now, um, yes, I agree, you know, we, we should, so as an academic, I understand that in a situation like this, outside of the politics, outside of the devastation, um, I keep telling you this proverb we have in Igbo land. I'm not going to say it in Igbo again. I, 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 I too do sometimes. If you do not know where rain beats you, it will beat you the second time. So as an academic, I'm all for let us find out where the source is. So something like that, so that we have knowledge. Unfortunately, we have geopolitical units and now there's infighting. So um, initially they said it was, um, it went from a rat through to another agent, to a bat, and then to human persons, again in Wuhan. Then there's the theory that um, there was an accident in a lab and by mistake it came out. And you know, it sounds like carelessness because we've all suffered it. But this is a clear and present danger. When you're conducting certain experiments, there's a risk that you're going to lose control of your specimens. So I am all for the investigation. Unfortunately, I have this suspicion that the infighting between China and the US will make it very, very difficult for us to find out the truth because China has countered and said that, well, they heard this thing oh, that there are certain labs, they didn't name any country, but of course they meant the US, that they heard that some labs should be investigated because it looks like warfare. So there's this back and forth. Unfortunately, hopefully they will get to the root of it, but um, I think politics is going to obscure the truth, but I'm glad that this process is happening. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, about COVID-19 that is political, mm. including some countries claiming that vaccines, uh, doses from their countries have been discredited uh, because uh, some other countries want to discredit their countries. But Yami, let me come to you quickly. We have just about two minutes to wrap up the program. Um, on this one, I'm with Dr. Omane. I, it's not surprising that America wants to know sort of their stock in trade in trying to get to the bottom of things. We've also said that COVID is compared to things that are killing other people across the world is minute. Mm -hmm. I mean. This is not to uh, make light of people who have lost their lives. It is minute in terms of numbers, and we've seen that. But it is an interesting study because how it came on board, how it went through the world so quickly is definitely a, a study of interest. And it's not surprising. And I do agree with her as well that America and China will not see it as we're working together mm. to solve a global problem because both of them are pointing fingers at each other. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Well, uh, Prof, quickly, we have just a minute to go. China, United States, 
are both directly responsible. Because literature has shown that uh, Americans were giving scholarship research projects to work in Huan. So in this particular case, uh, front and back, there's no way one can be free of the discharge. They are both responsible. Well, but I think what is important is the objective of the WHO to find out the exact origins of the uh, virus so that uh, the entire global community can be better prepared mm -hmm. know, for know. the next pandemic. They do know. Can, you know, take necessary steps yes. uh, to prevent the kind of chaos uh, mm -hmm. that uh, COVID-19 has imposed on the rest of the world. Sure. Well, you've been watching this day live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, bye for now. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again next Sunday. <laughs>